Hey folks, Craig here, and uh, welcome to another video where I'm just doing a little bit of art, and we're hanging out, and we're relaxing, uh, kind of like ASMR maybe, kind of like slow TV, uh, however you want to look at it, I guess. Uh, today I'm going to be doing uh, some sledding uh, artwork, a sledding illustration, um, and you're going to watch it all in real time, uh, beginning to end. Well, not quite the beginning. I laid down the pencils before the video. Um, but I'm not, I'm not very com I'm not confident enough in pencils to, uh, show those on video. Pencils for me are, you know, me working out placement and stuff like that. And, uh, I, I, I guess I would just feel very awkward having that filmed. Um, but, uh, yeah, I hope, uh, I hope you have a, uh, like a cup of coffee, uh, a handheld video game, maybe some art of your own to do. And this is going to be about an hour long. So I hope you enjoy it. Um, some other folks in the last video said they really enjoyed this format, which I really appreciate. I'm glad you gave it a chance and I'm glad you liked it. That means a lot to me. Uh, my cousin said she watched it while she was doing other work. She's a full-time photographer. She's fantastic. She did the photos for my wedding. Um, a friend said that they uh, played WoW. They're doing like their routine WoW stuff for the Warcraft while they watched the video, which is great. Um, CL said they ate dinner, which is, you know, hey, yeah, have a meal. Let's do it. Uh, super cute llama said they, they, they crafted while watching the video. They did needlework, um, which is really cool. My wife does cross stitch. She's very good at it. She, she made me this, uh, this Holtzman from Ghostbusters answer the call, uh, which I, I you know, I, I like that movie probably more than most other people did. It's not amazing, but I enjoyed it probably more than the average person. And I think Kate McKinnon really stole whatever scene she was in. So my wife made this. And then one year for my birthday, my wife also made me this Majora's Mask cross stitch. And she spent hours on this. I mean, we would be in the same room while she was working on it. I couldn't see it for obvious reasons, but she just, she spent so many hours on this and it came out so great. Um, so yeah, you know, shout out, shout out to needlework, shout out to artists of all kinds. Um, you know, before, before I really get into this video, I wanted to bring up some points that people raised in the, la in the comments of the last video. Um, the first is the camera setup, which I myself brought up during the course of the video. And um, ideally this would be a two camera kind of video series, one on me and one on the art. Um, I, I, don't, I don't really have two cameras. I'm using my phone to film this. And uh, I do have another camera. It's, it's, it's a Sony like handy cam from like seven years ago that I used to record my old YouTube videos with. And it's just not great. It doesn't have the storage capacity to do like an hour of filming either. Um, so I, I just, I don't have uh, the ideal setup and I'm not, I just don't want to invest the money either if I'm being frank. Um, th th in addition to the money, the other issue is that, um, some people are going to relate to this and some people are not. They're, they're, they're going to have no idea what I'm talking about. But I don't like disturbing my space with stuff like that, with like multiple tripods and then audio equipment. And so I don't I don't like doing that. Um, my desk space has been slowly cultivated over the last year or so to be a space that I want to do work in, that I want to do illustrating work. And all my tools are here. My, my, my paint is here. My, my ink is here. Everything's here for me to do that work so I can just sit down and begin working in a space that I like. When I start setting up all these tripods around me and all this other stuff, like it's more setup time and then it becomes, it also becomes an uncomfortable space. And then it turns doing art into a kind of chore that I don't, I don't want to do. Um, so yeah, I mean, in an ideal world, I'd have two cameras, but I don't, I don't think I'm going to be doing that. Um, it's a good suggestion, but I don't think I'm going to be doing that. Um, I, it kind of comes back to what I said last video where, YouTubers who, who, in all fairness, have really just raised the bar for standards. I mean, it, it's great what they're doing, but unfortunately, it, it sort of imposes this standard for the rest of us. And it's and it's not typical for someone to have two cameras and two tripods and and recording equipment. That's just not typical, um, you know. And if the average Joe is still welcome to make videos here, you know, sometimes you just I think the viewer has to make a concession in their head saying, yeah, all right, this is just a dude. He's not, he doesn't have millions of, subs of subscribers. He doesn't, I don't even have ads on my videos. Just, I'm not making money from this. So, uh, you know, sometimes it's worth keeping in mind that those things, even though they seem normal because other YouTubers are doing them, the average person, it's just not, that's not typical. Um, 
And, uh, you know, I remember, you know, when I was really heavily doing video game videos and, you know, I was watching other people doing them and they had their filming set up in their game room. I, I mean, they would just leave the setup there because it was a lot easier to, to film videos. They would film, you know, several videos a week, at least one, but oftentimes several, you know, to appease the almighty algorithm. And they would just leave all these tripods and like light screens and, and lights and stuff. And there'd be cables running around. I'm like, oh my God, I just, I'm, I'm having an anxiety attack just looking at pictures of your game room. When I had a game room, I don't anymore. I don't own enough games to have a game room. I don't have enough rooms for a game room. Uh, but when I had a game room, it was supposed to be a space away from that kind of stuff. Uh, I did film in it, but it was just a matter of setting up a tripod with a camera and like literally nothing else. I didn't have any other equipment. And my videos were, you know, not as polished because of that. But, you know, I wanted a space that was conducive to playing games. And that's kind of like my desk here where it's conducive to doing art. Um, another point that people raised was the audio. And this one was fair. Actually, I anticipated this. Actually, when I filmed that, the last video, I did record a separate audio track. I do have a professional microphone. It's what I'm using right now. It's what I use for my podcast. Um, and I had that recording to Audacity while I was talking to the camera. But for the life of me, I could not get that audio track to sync up. Um, you know, when I first started filming, I like I clapped <laughs> to give myself a reference point. And it would sync and it would stay synced for several minutes. But as time went on, just slowly, 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 the audio was getting away from the video. I don't know why that is. Um, I mean, obviously, I've done videos and podcasts for years. So I have some minimal op you know, operational understanding of AV. But obviously uh, not enough to figure out why like something like that would happen. Um, and that's, and that's fine. What I'm doing here is actually, obviously I've pointed the camera at the art, um, which with a one camera setup, if I have to make a choice, I think having it on the art is better than having it on my face. You know, the art changes, my face really does not. Um, and I'm recording the audio later as voiceover. Um, it makes it a bit less like organic, I guess, but, uh, I don't plan on doing like any edits or retakes or anything like that unless, you know, something, you know, someone knocks at the door or something. I don't plan on doing that because I, I do want to keep it as real and, and conversational as possible. Uh, but this means that I can actually use my professional microphone and give you better sound quality. And because the camera is on the art, I don't have to sync it to my mouth movements. <laughs> that won't be a problem. Uh, so, you know, regardless, un unless I start investing all this kind of money and start disturbing my space, you know, I'm going to have to make concessions. And this setup here, I think is the, the best setup It is the fewest concessions with the best possible overall result. Uh, of course I am always welcome to, to feedback and suggestions, but I think this is what I'm going to be rolling with, uh, for the time being. It's the best overall setup for what I have and what I want to accomplish, even if it's not perfect. I did get a lot of feedback. You know, it's interesting because there's just always these polarizing uh, opinions. You know, some people said, oh, the, 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 the audio has like all this white noise and it sounds watery. And it did. It sounded very watery and there's a lot of white noise. And some people said, oh, I love the white noise. You know, as someone who actually listens to a lot of ASMR videos, I actually like the ASMR videos with the white noise. I'm not sure why. Um, the ones where like, oh, I have a binaural mic and it cost me a thousand dollars and I sound like this. Hello, we're going to do your makeup today. Um, I'm not into that. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. The, the, the polished effect kind of takes me out of it, I guess. Uh, so I can appreciate the, you know, the uh, people who like the white noise, but... I don't know if that's what I'm trying to accomplish here. So we're going to roll with this. Some people said they preferred the video on my face versus the art. Uh, you know, some people said, no, I'd rather see the art. That's more, you know, Bob Ross like, I guess. So it's just interesting because people, you know, I'm not going to be able to please everyone. There's going to be people that just have the, the polar opposite opinions. Uh, so um, I, I think this is the, this is this is what I'm going to roll with, though. I appreciate all the feedback. Um, I did solicit questions, uh, for, for upcoming videos. So I guess this would be the upcoming video. Some people did leave questions in the comments. If you'd like to leave me a question for a future video like this, uh, just please, please leave the question in the comments. It can be video game related. Um, but it could be about anything really. Um, I don't know the schedule that I'm going to do, you know, for these videos. Um, this second one came pretty quickly off the heels of the first video. And that's basically because I wanted to take all those suggestions from the first video, what I learned from the first video, refine them, and then do a second video that was 
more closer to what this series is going to look like, you know, from episode to episode. That first one was a rough pilot. Um, so this is, this is going to be more like what this series is like, but I, and I don't know how often that's going to happen. Um, I'm not looking to appease an algorithm for ad revenue. So, you know, I'll try and do as many as I can for those that enjoy them, but I, I don't know. Um, as for some questions here, we have Drew Rikes to pray. Um, he asks, or they asks, I'm going to use they only because I, I'm, I don't, <laughs> I know this has become a meme, but I don't want to assume people's gender. It's hard to know uh, if someone is a is a man or a woman online. With a name like Drew, it's probably a man. Um, but they ask, why did you delete all of your game collection videos? They were my favorite. So all of my past videos, and there's hundreds of them, uh, they're, they're private. They're not deleted, um, mainly because if I deleted them, they, they just wouldn't exist anymore because I don't have backups of them. Um, no, they're private. I, I, um, I went through this period where like, I really wanted to contract my online footprint. So like, uh, you know, Twitter auto archives, all of your tweets that are old, that are like past like 3,500 or something like that, or 2,500, somewhere in that vicinity. And they're auto archived. They're not immediately accessible to anyone. They're not Googleable. Um, they can use, people can use the, you know, advanced Twitter search tools to find your old tweets. Um, but I thought, well, that's fine. Okay, I can live with that. Because it's not like I said anything that was outrageous. It's not like, you know, suddenly people are going to find out I'm like a racist or anything like that. It's just, I guess I started to feel like my stuff does not need to live online in perpetuity <laughs> forever. Um, you know, maybe there's some value in, in eph eph ephemeral online content, you know? Like, are people stressing out that their GeoCities or Angel Fire site doesn't exist anymore? No. So, um, you know, there, there's this, like this weird push to make everything last forever online. And I don't, you know, something, some things are worth that for sure. But some things, it's just, you know, my farts in the wind on Twitter don't need to last forever, I don't think. And I went through like my personal Facebook. And again, I mean, there's nothing like outrageous there. It's set to private anyway. It's only, you know, only my friends can see my Facebook. But I'm just like, I don't, this old stuff does not need to last forever. So I actually went manually went through unless you like nuke your whole your options on Facebook are nuke your whole Facebook or delete tweets one by one. And I deleted something like seven or eight years worth of Facebook stuff uh, one by one. And it took me it took me a couple of weeks. I just chipped away at it. So really only have is like the last four years worth of stuff, five years worth of stuff. When I from basically like from when I first met my wife and on, like this is a new era of my life or whatever. And like I'll preserve this, but the rest of it can go. Um, and then YouTube, I basically had the same mindset, um, but I didn't I didn't delete it. That stuff is a little bit different than tweets or like random Facebook statuses. You know, that's stuff that could be worth preserving in some capacity. So it's just set to private. And again, my thought process was like, I don't think this needs to last forever. Um, but I do understand that some people like watching those. They like going back to those. And, and I, and I, like, I appreciate that as a person who made those, I appreciate that people come back and watch those. That means a lot to me. Um, but so the only thing I can say is I'm sorry that I, I feel the way that I do about, you know, making some things private. And I hope that you at least understand somewhat where I'm coming from. Um, but because they're private, like if I do change my mind, you know, we all go through phases. I didn't, you know, I didn't do anything rash. I didn't delete them. So, you know, they could come back or maybe I'll like pick and choose like the good stuff. Like maybe like the crappy stuff doesn't need to come back, but some stuff does. Um, my collection videos are hilariously out of date. Anyway, I've gotten rid of a lot of my games. You know, I had, you know, over 2000 games at one point, video games. And, you know, now I probably own Mm, fewer than a thousand, I think probably around 800 if I had to guess somewhere in that vicinity, which is still a lot. That's more than the average person, I'm sure, but, um, it's far less than I used to own. So those collection videos, they're so out of date. Um, I guess I mean, maybe even the opinions are out of date. My opinions change on, on games sometimes. So I don't know, but, uh, maybe sometime in the future, maybe I'll make new ones. Probably not. It's not really my jam these days, but maybe I can think of some way to creatively, uh, do, game collection videos because just sitting there like holding up a game or putting it on the desk or whatever, it just doesn't do anything for me anymore i get so bored just thinking about it um blinkoom asked a very interesting question they asked what is it that you love most out of making gaming videos and podcasts and what do you hope to keep getting out of making them 
do you think your game choices are ever influenced by your desire for those things or are they completely separate? So this, this is a really interesting question. So what do I get out of, we'll, we'll start with what do I get out of uh, making gaming videos and podcasts? And I like making things in general. Um, if you haven't caught on, I'm a, I'm a creative person um, and I like making things. And for me, um, podcast, well, the podcast is very, uh, I mean, that's just, producing that is the same thing. Like every episode, it doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't really change, but videos can be pretty creative. And I've always tried to do new things within a certain framework. And, um, you know, like this type of video included, you know, I want to satisfy a creative itch doing this. And it's just one medium. And I think that's why with, with videos, I've, I've finally convinced myself it's okay to not be popular. It's okay if you don't get a ton of views. As long as the people who are watching you enjoy what you're doing, it doesn't really matter. Um, I do like the thumbs up, though. I'll be honest. Like, that is the one thing. <laughs> Thumbing up the video does make me feel like, all right, I'm on the right track. Like, that, at least, is I do like that. I don't need to make money from it. It's just a medium that I occasionally dabble in, like, say, like, alcohol markers or something. I don't use those regularly, but, you know, I have that in my toolkit. And I enjoy video games. And a big part of a big part of video games for me has always been sharing them. Um, I don't play a ton. I mean, I play a ton of like Overwatch, I guess. So I do play multiplayer games, but I don't play a ton of like multiplayer with like friends. I don't really play like Overwatch with friends or anything like that. So the social component of gaming for me is talking about video games or sharing my thoughts on them or reading other people's thoughts. That's the social component to video games for me. And it always has been. You know, I've had the internet, you know, I had it in my home growing up. We got it in like 98 or something like that. Immediately, I started making websites. I made a Zelda website and, you know, uh, I, I was in AOL chat rooms dedicated to video games and talking about games. You know, that that sharing component was huge for me. And, you know, in, in YouTube's infancy, I'm like, well, this is a place where I can just put my dumb, stupid, ugly face on camera and just talk about games I like. You know, my first video game video was about The World Ends With You. It had just, it recently, not just come out, it was a very recent DS game. And most people hadn't heard about it at that point. I just wanted to say, hey, I really like this game. And that's what I did. I just sat down my MacBook on the coffee table, sat down on the floor in front of it and said, hey, I really like this game. Here's how it plays. And I get something from that. I get a sense of satisfaction um, sharing what I enjoy about video games. If you noticed a lot of my videos, um, they're not really negative. I don't really rant. You know, I do say that I don't like things or I don't care for this. So that does happen because, you know, I don't love everything, but I try to keep the subject matter focused on the things that I do like, because that's the value in it for me is just to talk about the things that I enjoy. Um, and that's what I hope to keep getting out of it is just to keep sharing things I enjoy. Here, in, in this case, I get to share some art with you. I get to relax with you. This is very, I'm just sitting here, chilling out, relaxing uh, at my desk. Uh, I have one of the cats out here with me. It's great. And uh, my wife is in the other room. She's playing Fallout 76. I think she's hate playing Fallout 76, but. <laughs> uh, and I get to share the art. I get to share, I get to answer your questions, which I think is great. It, it adds to the communal the social aspect that I'm looking for. Uh, it's not live. It's not a live stream, but it's still that, that back and forth is still there. And I like that. This other question though is very interesting. Do you think your game choices are ever influenced by your desire for those things? Or are they completely separate? Um, nowadays they're completely separate, but at my peak on YouTube when I was making, I think, uh, I think the average was like five point something or other videos a month. And I was very active and I don't think you could ever really call me popular, but I certainly, I certainly have my place, I guess. And yeah, uh, I would admit to buying some games so that I could then talk about them, I, you know, and like I had probably more money than cents back then. I mean, you know, I don't really want to get into it, but I did, I did make okay money. So yeah, for me, like buying games wasn't like this huge burden, even if I wasn't that into the game, which is like entirely wasteful. Now I would not do that at age 35. I would not buy, I would not do that. I'm very much more careful about what games I buy. Um, which as an aside is like when people ask, oh, you should do your monthly collection update videos. Dude, I buy like two or three games to max, max in a month. Uh, once a year, I have a spending spree. I do this once a year, usually like later in the year or earlier in the year, like right around the winter time where like seasonal affectation disorder or whatever kicks in and I do some retail therapy go on eBay and I spend a couple like a couple hundred dollars on some retro games and knock them off my list 
And that's about it. That's the only time you would see like a really comprehensive collection update video. Otherwise, it's just like, yep, here are the two games I bought. <laughs> like I don't really buy that much anymore. Um, but back then I did. I did buy games because I thought that I, that it would, uh, I could talk about them for sure. Um, but I was more willing to be experimental. It's not like I got nothing out of them. It wasn't purely for that, but it was mostly for that. So like you take a game like Dead Space 2, right? I think I did a review on that. And I bought like the limited edition with the crappy like laser cutter like toy. Like now that thing would be full size. Now in a limited edition, that thing would be like $250 and be like a full size like plasma cutter or whatever it's called. And back then it was like this little like Happy Meal toy that like had LEDs and it was so you couldn't even hold it. It didn't even fit in your hand. And I bought that. And then I played the game and I did a review on it. And, but the thing is like I didn't really like love like the first Dead Space. I mean, it was fine. I don't really have anything negative to say, but it just wasn't my cup of tea, I guess. But like, here I am doubling down on a limited edition so I could talk about it on on YouTube. Um, but again, I was more willing to be uh, experimental back then because I had the money to throw around to do that, to just play things that were maybe on the edge of my tastes. Um, but, uh, you know, as a side note, like there's some value in that too. Like I, you know, I came to appreciate games. That I don't know if I would have appreciated if I didn't push those boundaries for myself, things like shoot 'em ups, like cave shoot 'em ups, like Dodonpachi or uh, death smiles. Did cave do death smiles? I don't remember, but you know, like games like that, you know, I started playing those because I'm like, yeah, let's give this a shot, you know, and then I can talk about it. If I, you know, if nothing else, I can talk about it. It turns out, I like that stuff. So there was some good of that, but, um, they were not completely separate. There was, it was more like a Venn diagram back then. Now they're mostly separate because I don't, obviously I don't make videos about it. Um, I do have the podcast, uh, shout out to Ludo Wave Radio. You can find us wherever you find podcasts. And, um, but even then I don't buy games to talk about in the podcast. We just recorded an episode last night and I was just like, Yep, really have been playing, you know, Travis Strikes Again. That's the only new game I had to talk about. Um, and that's, you know, like a 30 or $40 game. You know, I'm not buying games just for the just for the podcast. Uh, so that's an interesting question, yeah. Because, and then you have to be removed from that situation, I think, to be, to admit to stuff like that, to admit to your behavior. Like, if you asked me you know, like eight years ago, like, oh, are you buying games just to talk about them on YouTube? I'd be like, no, nope, no, nope, but I'm, you know, I'm doing it because I want to, you know, try out something new or, you know, I want to add, I want to curate my collection or whatever. And those things are all true. Like they, that's not inaccurate, but I would put much more weight. I, if I was trying to explain myself, I would put more weight on those things than there really is. You know, the truth of the matter is I wanted to talk about them. That's the biggest reason. The other reasons were just sort of secondary. So yeah, that's an interesting question. Landon Hughes asks, are you excited for the eighth generation of Pokemon to come out this year? Why or why not? And the answer is uh, yes, actually. So Pokemon, I, I was I was into Pokemon from the get-go. I bought Pokemon Red version the day it came out. So uh, sometimes I'm a trendsetter. Pokemon is one of those things. And then as years went on, I started to loathe Pokemon. Um, some people love like Pokemon X and Y, for instance. Uh, or, oh no, black and white is one that people like, oh, I hear people say they love black and white. I couldn't stand black and white. Uh, Pokemon had become so bogged down with all these systems. And that's the thing. I think a lot of people who like invest time in Pokemon really love all the systems heavy stuff. But the problem was all that, the, the framework was still the same. So like you have like this game, like just burdened that was built for like the original Game Boy overburdened by all these systems that was just, it felt like it was never designed to handle. So like, oh, I got to use a potion. Well, it takes like eight button presses to use like a single potion. And it's like, this is this just feels creaky. It just feels slow and agonizing to play. And, and predictable too, and predictable. Uh, you know, I'm going to get the HM to cut and I'm going to defeat this gym leader. And I, it, was, it was predictable and slow. And to me, it just felt um, agonizing to play. Uh, I got some enjoyment out of X and Y, but it's just, it, the series wasn't doing it for me. And then, um, no, not X and, was it, I know Diamond and Pearl, I'm sorry. I got some enjoyment out of Diamond and Pearl, but it, it, it just at that point, I'm like, nah, this isn't it. It's when X and Y came out. Um, that was a, a, a pretty good step forward, I think. I think that that game moved a bit faster. 
It was prettier. It defied expectations. You know, it didn't really just do the same thing over and over again, which is nice. Um, and I enjoyed that. And uh, I would have to say that, uh, oh man, what, what's the what's the newest one? Moon, moon, sun, sun and moon. Well, I uh, I think uh, there was some re-releases or updated versions of those, but sun and moon. I hadn't played the updated ones. I bought them, of course, but I haven't played them. Uh, I played Moon, and um, I loved it. That's my that's my favorite Pokemon game. It's fast. It's snappy. Again, it, it does things that defies your expectations. It doesn't have the standard gym leader stuff. Um, you know, the I mean, I don't know. I don't really play Pokemon for the story, but again, you know, something a little out of the norm. I, I love the Alolan versions of the Pokemon. Like, I, like my favorite Pokemon for a long time has been Vaporeon. Uh, for a very long time. But I would have to say Alolan Raichu is right. I don't know which is my favorite. I'm, I'm torn. I love them both. Um, so I've, I've come to really enjoy the modern Pokemon games. And then I actually really like Pokemon Let's Go. I got Eevee. And I, I, I really enjoyed that game. It was very comforting. Um, it wasn't terribly difficult, but I, I don't feel like that's the point. Like, you know, something doesn't have to be difficult to be enjoyable, I don't think. Um, and I just, I, I really like that game. There's a lot of smart changes to it. Um, I don't know if some of those changes will carry over to the eighth generation, but things like separating the capture system from the battle system, that's long overdue. It just, it's weird to me that you beat the crap out of these animals <laughs> before you capture them. Um, so I think making those two, those two separate systems was smart, whether the, you know, the actual eighth generation coming out this year has to mimic Pokemon go, maybe not, but having something separate from battle, I think would be more engaging as well. Not just, not just make more sense canonically, but would just be more engaging overall. Otherwise I'm just mashing a, whether I'm capturing or battling, I'm just mashing a, and like, I don't want to do that, you know, separate those things. I also like seeing the Pokemon on the map. That makes everything a lot easier, I think. Um, and to me, like it, it, you know, it makes it more engaging. Now, now I can, I now I can go Pokemon hunting. Now I'm not wasting my time. I mean, that's the thing. You're still playing the game. I think a lot of people think that like making things easier makes a game worse. But really, what's happening here is that it's the game has stopped wasting my time. I'm, I'm not walking through grass like aimlessly trying to find this Pokemon. I can clearly see it, and then I still have to cap. Like there's still a comp- uh, like an active player component to that. I still have to capture it. So uh, I like a lot of those changes. Um, I like some of the like the tweaks to like the story progression in Pokemon Let's Go versus say Pokemon Red or Blue. Uh, just overall, yeah, I, I, I've liked where the series has gone, and that's coming from someone who liked the series, got sick of the series. And now really likes it again. Um, so yeah, um, very long winded, but I am I am definitely uh, interested in the eighth generation and seeing what they're doing. Hopefully they, they take some of the things they did in X and Y and some of the things they did in Let's Go, put those together, put out a really good game. Uh, uh, Damate Kudasai asks, uh, is there any older game that you'd want ported to Switch? <laughs> Uh, yeah, all of them, <laughs> put everything on the switch. That's, you know, as, as I'm sure some of, you know, I'm a handheld gamer. I love playing on handhelds. I, I almost never put my switch on the dock. I only put my switch on the dock to play like couch multiplayer games. That's it. I've never seen breath of the wild on a TV in person. <laughs> I have no idea what it looks like. Um, uh, so yeah, put everything on the switch. That's perfectly fine. I mean, you know, if you want to, if you want a, a specific answer, the specific answer would be, um, well, we have we have the Grandia collection coming out here pretty soon. Gung Ho is putting out Grandia one and two on the Switch. Uh, they they said it's coming this winter, so that could be any time between now and uh, you know like late March, which is not an answer. I feel like just put the game out. Can you get? I mean, that's two months. That's two months of time. I think you can put a release date within two months, right? Um, but I'm really excited to play Grandia two again. I was right before they announced that I was having this itch to play Grandia two, but I don't want to hook up the Dreamcast and you know, playing 480i or whatever, you know, I don't want to do that. If I can play on, on, on a handheld, a modern handheld that I'm actually using in high def, yeah, that'd be great. So I'm, I've been waiting. Um, but to go along with that, I would love to see Skies of Arcadia on the Switch. Um, Skies is, uh, you know, I don't know, uh, 
those of you that remember this, but Skies of Arcadia and Grandia 2 were like the premier JRPGs uh, coming out for the Dreamcast back in like, I think it was like 2000. And they came out like, I think within a month of each other. And back then it was like, you know, you weren't getting like a hit game, like several hit games like every month. And then indie games like as well. Like that's just not how gaming worked back then. So to have like two big games that you're anticipating coming out within a month of each other. I mean, that's especially when, I mean, how old was I? 16, 17? You know, it's not like I have a ton of money. I can't afford two games in a month. Are you kidding me? So, you know, I had to pick. It was a really tough decision. And uh, I, I went with Grandia 2 first. That was, I eventually got both, but I got Grandia 2 first. I think I got Skies with, like, Christmas money or something. And um, it was just, you know, those, those two games are linked in my head because they're on the same platform, came out around the same time, just very hyped. And uh, it'd be great to have them both on the Switch. I mean, as a matter of fact, it'd be great to have all kinds of Dreamcast games on the Switch. Games from that era, that era of gaming is like my favorite. I would say like mid-90s, like 96, like the N64, basically N64 lifespan. The N60, like 96 through like 2000, like 2001. Yeah, 96 through 2001 is my favorite era of gaming. The N64, Game Boy Color, and Dreamcast. I just have a lot of memories of that, you know. Um, you know, I was old enough to have some pocket money and occasionally buy a game. You know, I was social. I was playing with my friends. Uh, my siblings were at ages where the, where we could all play together. So, you know, we were doing that. Um, this is a really enjoyable era of gaming for me. So I would love to see some Dreamcast games. I don't know what it is about game companies where they don't... They don't curate their games as well as they should. Uh, Nintendo is very guilty of this too. Like, you know, with Nintendo, <laughs> uh, we have Nintendo Switch Online on the Switch, and part of the value of that package is having all these NES games that they add to that library, and that is a pretty decent value. You know, especially when you're only paying twenty bucks a year. Like, my wife and I have like a family plan, so we're paying thirty-five for two people, so we're paying less than that. It, 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 you know, if you do a family plan and add the eight people to that plan, and everyone pitches in, it does become a pretty good, pretty decent value. But the thing is, with starting out with NES games, like Nintendo always does this. Whenever they do like a virtual console or something like that, they just they always go back to the NES. And I get it; it was their first, you know, like home console. Um, but those, I, it, those games, I, I just I hate to say this is going to sound like, like not li- very unlike me, but I just don't feel like those games are relevant anymore. And partially is is because of their age; they're very old. You know, maybe we can get some games that, you know, uh, came out after the Reagan administration for crying out loud. Um, but uh, it's it's their age, but it's also the fact that they've been re-released over and over again. And they just they're 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 not as valuable, uh, not just in terms of money, but in terms of experience as they once were. Um, so uh, personally, I mean, you look at like you look at the N64, the thing came out in, in 96 and, you know, you have people who voted in the midterm elections here in America last year who, uh, you know, are younger than the Nintendo 64. <laughs> like, they are flat out adults that can vote and buy alcohol and, uh, and uh, they are younger than the Nintendo 64. That's wild. That's wild. That's, that is an old console, <laughs> you know, like start curating those games and curate them better. Um, uh, same thing with like the GameCube, and and Sega's terrible at this. Sega's released like thirty seven variations of like a, a Genesis Micro Console, Mega Drive, whatever you want to call it, and then they announced one after the NES Classic, and everyone's like, "Oh, Sega's doing. Sega's done it a million times. Who cares? It's not news." They keep releasing Genesis Classics over and over again. Every platform since the PS2 has had a Genesis Classics collection. And in some ways, like, in addition to Sega Ages, of course, Sega Ages are great, but I don't need to play OutRun on every single platform I own. Um, You know, on the one hand, it's great that they are continuing to preserve the Genesis era of games, but what about everything else? Um, I know the Saturn is next to impossible to emulate, but, like, there's the Dreamcast. And again, the Dreamcast came out 20 years ago. (laughs) Again, there are people that voted in the midterm elections last year that are younger than the Dreamcast. It's old. Time does weird stuff when you're when you get older. I'm 35 and sometimes I think, you know, 
<laughs> like 99 was just like, oh, that's just, that was just 10 years ago. No, dude, it was 20 years ago. It was so long ago. And that system is old. It's time to start curating that stuff. And uh, I think the Switch is a great, great system to do that. Um, I'm biased, of course. I like handheld and I like Nintendo. But, you know, it's a system that, you know, again, you can play on the TV, you can play on the go, you can play, you know, socially. It's highly encouraged to play socially. It's a good system to do that. You know, bring back, come on, bring back Choo Choo Rocket. Let's do this. Let's make this happen. I only got so much to ask for. <laughs> um, Soapy Lion asks, uh, any games you're excited for this year? And then adds Animal Crossing Switch with a question mark and an exclamation point and intro bang. Um uh, that's, I don't know if you heard that. That's my, that's my cat sneezing. Um, even though I'm recording the audio later, I can certainly do edits and, and retakes, but I'm not going to do that because I think it would ruin the conversational nature. Um, so you're, you're going to get it live. Um, uh, yes, I'm very much looking forward to Animal Crossing Switch. Uh, I would say that of all like the big budget games that we know about this year, I think that's the one I'm looking forward to most. I love Animal Crossing. I played so much of New Leaf, and uh, I'm very looking forward to, like, New Leaf, but bigger and more, I guess. Not too much more. Animal Crossing's not about volume, I guess, but, you know, something a little bit more to appease people like me who sunk 200 hours into New Leaf. Um, As I mentioned, I'm also very much looking forward to Grandia 2. But other than that, I can't. I can't, I can't think of anything. I, I feel like we don't really know as much about games that are coming out this year. Um, I think Kingdom Hearts 3 comes out in a few days. I'm not as, I'm not as into, you know, I've played, I think, almost every Kingdom Hearts game, but I'm not as into Kingdom Hearts as I, as I once was. And it's hard to say, really, because Kingdom Hearts, like, mechanically, like, 1 and 2 were... Uh, a little sloppy, I guess. You have these floaty jumps. You have this camera that just spins around wildly. Like, it's, it's you know, those kind of mechanical things are just, they're not great in Kingdom Hearts. But King, but since then, we've only really had handheld games. And in handheld games, like, stuff like that happens and you make that concession. You go, okay, well, it's the DS. Like, it's going to be weird. Whatever. That's fine. You know, we haven't had, like, a, like a proper uh, console release in 13 years so maybe they ironed all that stuff out maybe they ironed out the controls and the camera and things like that um i don't know if i care enough to 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 see that for myself but yeah we got kingdom hearts 3 but i I don't you know what else what else big is coming this year i don't know uh animal crossing is all i need obviously metroid prime 4 is not a big thing coming this year uh that's a shame but i think nintendo handled that pretty well uh but yeah, Animal Crossing Switch. Definitely, definitely looking forward to that. Uh, use the boost. Asked, asked a really interesting question. Uh, this one's not game related. Uh, it's more art related, which is also uh, conducive to the video. Um, use the boost asks, uh, I want to keep painting more, but I can never come up with an idea good enough to justify wasting a canvas. Uh, I found myself just wanting to slap stuff around and abstractly play with colors, but I like more solid concepts. Sometimes I use prompts, uh, but my question is, where do your ideas come from, what to paint or draw? Oh, wait, I I read that wrong. Oh, yeah, but where do those ideas come from is what you're saying. I I misphrased that, my mistake. Um, uh, This this question is actually, like, for me, uh, for my thought process, like, multi-part. So I saw your art, and it's and it's fun. Um, he did. Uh, I think it was you. I'm fr- fairly certain it was you. I don't know if I dreamt that. I'm extremely online, and I take in way too much content. I think, but I think you did some uh, controller, like stylized controller buttons for uh, Nintendo controllers. If I'm not mistaken, correct me if I'm wrong. And they look good. They were fun. Um, and I'm and I'm pretty sure that was acrylic that you were working in. Um, so I occasionally work in acrylic and my, but my acrylic success rate is probably about 50%. And by that, I mean, you know, pieces that either a accomplish what I sought out to do or B, uh, they didn't accomplish what I sought out to do because they got kind of screwed up along the way, but I'm still happy with the end result. And I'd say maybe only half the time that happens. The other half the time, uh, the result is not rad. I've thrown away a lot of art. 
Uh, sometimes my wife looks at me incredulously, like you're throwing that out. And I'm like, I just, I bang this stuff. I make this stuff. Like, like I am the resource. <laughs> like, it's not like we're mining it from the earth and we're running out. Like it comes from me. It's fine. I'll make more. Um, uh, cause it's just, it's not great. It's not worth keeping. It's not worth taking up that space. Um, so your first problem might be your medium. I don't know. I mean, there's not enough specifics in your, your question here to say, um, I know that I wanted to work in acrylic for a while because, well, I was very intimidated by oils. Uh, so acrylic seemed like a good compromise, but I guess painting with like a brush and like paint on a canvas just seems more professional, more fine arty than illustrating an ink and watercolor like I'm doing. So I, I wanted to be perceived as a more traditional professional artiste and was doing that with acrylics. Um, but the thing is, they're not really my medium. Like I can do good stuff. We have good stuff hanging up in our home. I've sold good stuff, but it's just not consistent. Part of that is because I don't practice enough. Um, you know, you talk about wasting a canvas and that's part of it. Um, but it's also like wasting your time. Like there's so much time in acrylics, you, just, you know, it's, it's setting up your palette, getting the paints out, getting your brushes, painting, waiting for layers to dry, uh, you know, washing your palette, washing your brushes, putting things away. It's, it's, it takes a mind boggling amount of time. And unless you've carved a space for that stuff to happen, unless you have like a small studio corner or something like that, it's very difficult. Um, like I said, early in the video, I've, I've made this space at my desk, uh, for illustrating, and that makes it easier to consistently do. Um, obviously, I need a much smaller space to do that, uh, but uh, I don't have the space to have like a devoted acrylic <laughs> a studio corner or whatever. Um, and that makes it more difficult to want to practice. Like even if I had the time and the money, um, it just I don't have the uh, desire, I guess, the drive. And so my acrylics don't improve. And then I get frustrated and my success rate is 50%. <laughs> um, so you didn't say anything about time, but time is a tough one with acrylic. When it comes to canvas, when it comes to wasting wasting a canvas, um, I don't know where you buy your canvas. I don't know where you get that stuff. There, There is acrylic paper. Um, I buy pads of it. It's by Canson. And I get it. I don't know what craft stores you have near you. I have AC Moore and I have Michael's. I prefer AC more. Um, I'm sure you can get Canson acrylic paper, a pad of acrylic paper on Amazon. I'm sure it's probably cheaper than AC more anyway. Um, but surprisingly that has a lower GSM, a lower weight than watercolor paper, but I think it's woven differently and it holds the acrylic pretty well. So you're not going to be able to slop layers on that. Um, but if you're looking to like practice, like put in that time to practice, um, Whatever it is, just basically the acrylic version of doodling. Um, acrylic paper could be a good choice. Again, you're not, you can't slop layers on there, but that could be a pretty good um, compromise, I guess. Um, when it comes to figuring out what I want to do, so with acrylics, I, I feel like with paint, I can be more expressive. Uh, Mm, at least emotionally, I can convey like a feeling in acrylic uh, that I better than I can with illustrating, which is ironic because I'm better at illustrating than I am at painting in acrylic. You'd think I'd be able to more adeptly do that with drawing, but I can't. Not yet. It's all about, you know, where your skill level is currently at. Mine is currently not there, but it could be later. Um, so I tend to think about emotional things and, you know... Um, that's, this is not what this episode's about, but <laughs> uh, I do have major depressive disorder. I have generalized anxiety disorder and panic attacks. And um, sometimes when I'm in a bad place, expressing that through art, you know, which is very trite, but is expressing that through art is, you know, one way of managing it. And I have been able to do that with acrylics 50% of the time. Um and I guess I don't really, th I just think about bad stuff. <laughs> there's no, there's no answer to that. I also like pop arty stuff. Um, I like cutesy things, things that are sometimes I would, I would say coded as feminine. Uh, I'm not really a feminine guy, but I think that like aesthetic, the, the feminine aesthetics I like, 
um, again, well, things that are coded feminine, you know, like the TV and lust color was teal because I like teal. I like teal. I like pink. I like purple. I like, uh, cutesy things. So, you know, like I have, uh, you know, a cutesy painting of like a squid hugging Tokyo tower. I have, you know, uh, some other things or pop arty and cute. And I like doing that when I'm in a good mood again, 50% of the time. Um, I, I don't, I can't really tell you where that comes from. I think that that's, that's something that comes from just understanding my own, uh, aesthetic, uh, understanding the things that I myself like and thinking, well, this would look cool. Like if I saw this somewhere, I would think that looked neat. So I don't see it anywhere. So why don't I make it? And some of it, you know, is part of my personal life. I mean, you know, here's an acrylic painting, um, that, you know, says Bon Appetit and it has, you know, again, it's that cutesy aesthetic and it has this man holding a piece of toast. Um, this, you know, this kind of comes back to my child. We were poor growing up. So like we would occasionally, uh, not occasionally, frequently, <laughs> the exact opposite of occasionally have, you know, really cheap dinners. Sometimes dinner was just a piece of toast. And uh, this is not a pity party, uh, to be clear. But um, I thought, it, to me, in my own head, there was a funny juxtaposition between this cute pop art that says Bon Appetit with a man holding this, this you know, this sad component of my childhood, you know, just having toast for dinner. Um, most people don't know that story. They look at that and they go, oh, it's a man holding a, 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 you know, a piece of bread or a muffin. It's fine. I mean, it goes along with the theme of the painting. I don't think anyone guesses that's where it comes from, but it came from my own experience. So, I, you know, I just sort of crossed those concepts. Um that's acrylic. I'm just trying to give you tips in acrylic because that's what it seems like you're working. But when it comes to, you know, illustrating here, as you see, um, you know, if you follow me on Twitter or on Instagram, you may have noticed, you may not have, that a lot of my art follows the seasons. I like seasonal art. I think it's a very New England thing to take stock of the seasons. It's also a very Japanese thing, um, too, actually. Uh, I like tracking the seasons. So a lot of my art ties into the seasons. Um... And then, so I think of things that happen in that season. So, you know, last video I did ice skating. In this video, I'm doing sledding. Uh, I did a cozy cottage before, and I did a mountain of hot cocoa uh, earlier uh, this winter. And so I think about, you know, how, things I do, things that are associated with the season. And then um, what I've come to do with my art is make it sort of dreamlike in a way. Um, I, I, I do that with like a soft palette of colors. I don't really, you know, I generally don't do very bright, bold, harsh colors. They're not very stark or opaque. Um, and I, you know, if it's not just a color, sometimes it's, you know, some aspect of it that is not quite real, maybe sort of exaggerated or cartoony. Like in this piece I'm working on here is like this, you know, huge hill and, you know, the snow sort of flying up like liquid. And I think that gives it a, you know, a dreamlike feel, you know, in the ice skating piece, you know, for me, like that's actually one of my favorite pieces I did. But, you know, for example, that one, the dreamlike aspect of that was the yellow sky. You know, I had noticed that in winter, sometimes like late in the day, you know, when the sun is setting, um, the sky takes on a very light lemony yellow hue. And I obviously exaggerated that and that for me gives it a very dreamlike appeal so I, t I pick seasons I pick seasonal things and then I make them just slightly dreamlike and I stumbled upon that as something that a I'm good at b something that sells and c something I'm happy with all three of those ingredients um just by practicing sometimes it prompts as you said fan art is another way um I, you know fan art is fun to do I still do it um, I just did this fun Yuri on Ice <laughs> watercolor piece for my wife. Um, so I still do fan art. Fan art has its place, but fan art's also good for practice because it can help you, um, you know, build up your technical skills, but it can also help you when you start composing fan art. It can help you identify the things that you actually like and are good at. And that's what happened to me. Um, 
So I don't know if that helped. <laughs> it basically boils down to practice and find out what works for you. And I hate that answer as an artist. I hate that because it's like, ugh, time. I got to put in time. I want to get good now. And it sucks when you're like decent at a thing and you're like, you know, the skill is latent. You know, it's there buried under the surface and you just want it and you know, you get there, but like you just hate putting in the time. It's so frustrating. Uh, so I feel you, but that's, that's the advice I have. I hope it's helpful. Um, I'm no expert. So, uh, 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 I don't know. I hope, I hope it does something for you. Um, I think we're coming to the end of, uh, the runtime of the video. Um, uh, I'm not sure. Cause again, I'm recording the audio separately, but it's approximately this long, I think. Um, so yeah, you know, if you want to sit some, submit some questions, please do leave them in the comments, leave some feedback in the comments. You just want to say hi, please do that in the comments. Uh, I really hope you enjoy, enjoyed this video. I hope it was relaxing for you. I hope that, uh, you know, you got something out of it. Uh, help you unwind. And uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you for watching. And, you know, if you want to follow me in other places, you know, of course, I'm here on YouTube. You can feel free to subscribe or or not. That's fine. Um, or you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram. I'm at TV and Lust on both of those places. Uh, and that those links are in the video description. And there is also the tv and less podcast uh not tv and less podcast i'm stuck on the, the the podcast it's basically the tv and less podcast but it's just called ludo wave it's called ludo wave radio now and you can there's a link to that in uh or uh, maybe i'll try and put multiple links I, i'm not sure i'm not i'm not sure what i'll do yet but there'll be a link to something ludo wave radio in the description and uh you can search for us in apple Podcasts, google play and stitcher that's predominantly about video games um, and you're not under no obligation to follow me in any of these places. That's fine. Not looking to build a brand, not looking, not looking for a payday, just looking to hang out and have a good time. Uh, so we're going to be wrapping up this piece. We'll have, uh, I'll have a picture of the finished product at the end. It was fun to do. I hope, I hope you enjoyed watching it. I hope you enjoyed listening in and, uh, until next time you guys take it easy.